my life is gaining confidence, thinking that I'm average, think I'm a mediocre, somebody believes in me, I submit to them, I do what they say, and then I find out that I can do more than I think I can do. Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis Show. We have a uh... Really uh, interesting guys, the best way that I could put it, because I, uh, the list of accolades is, is quite long. Robert, uh, and I will throw in your, your middle name because it is fun to say, Hamilton Owens, a veteran entrepreneur and athlete, badass athlete, I think it would, would follow that uh, or, or be the descriptor for the athlete part. Hey, welcome to the show, Robert. Hey, thanks, you guys. Great to be here. Yeah, man. I, you know, I, we were talking in the green room just a few minutes ago and I was, I was thinking, and, th- and this happens to me when sometimes I just, my mind chases a squirrel out somewhere, but the whole athlete thing just fascinates me. I mean, the call to serve is cool. I want to go back to that, but you know, I, I'm a closet athlete. I used to try to play some sports, but, but you've done it. And I'm, I'm curious you know, how, how did that grow into you? Because it feels like, I mean, from what I know and what we've talked about, it's happened almost later in life than it did earlier in life. Or did I misread that? You know, a little bit different. Um, I was really sort of a lost elementary junior high kid. When I got to, to 10th grade in high school, I'd been um, raised at the beach. Uh, my parents lived by Disneyland inland in Anaheim. My grandparents lived at the ocean. So every weekend we go to the ocean mm. and have boogie board and surf and all that stuff. When I got to high school, I was too small for football and too small for basketball. Wasn't any good in baseballs. So just didn't, didn't know where I fit if I wanted to do anything athletically. Mm-hmm. And um, prior to that, I, I had a, a bad feet. So I'm an adopted kid. Uh, my parents adopted me at three months old and I had bad legs. So I wore corrective boots and and metal bars in my, my, um, my shoes. And I couldn't run till about fifth grade. And so I was just trying to find my way. And when I finally got to high school, this kid said, Hey, um, you need to go out for swimming. And I said, really? He said, yeah, it's really great. Swimming water polo. And I said, okay. So I came over and talked to the coaches and the coaches said, you know, you're a little bit behind the game because most of these kids are age group swimmers. They started, you know, younger in life and then they got into junior high and then they got into high school. So they probably got five, six, seven years on you of uh, competitive swimming. But, you know, you, you look like you could probably do something. And the guy uh, that I had for a coach was a Hungarian and he didn't speak very good English. His name was John, J-O-N, John Urbanchek. And he said, Owens, you know, he looked at me and says, I'll teach you something. And that is the hard work can beat better talent. And he said, if you'll work hard and do what I say, you'll do good. And I just latched onto that and said, okay, I'll do whatever you say. And so he became, as well as the assistant coach, a guy named Howard Terry, they became father figures to a bunch of kids because um, most of our dads were not coming to any of the events because they were the greatest generation and they were out working hard. So the, all the sporting events had moms, but not too many dads. Anyway, um, when, I, when I learned that I could, I could work hard, I wasn't very good technically, but I knew how to work hard. He taught me how to work hard. And we had um, 6.30 in the morning to 7.30 swim. We had 1.30 to 3.30 swim. And if we were really committed, we'd come back at 6.30 at night and do our third workout, do thousands of yards. And we progressed and we did well. And um, I had the sort of my big breakthrough on this, you know, um, working hard and working smart can do things for you. And I, uh, most of the guys at my high school were beach lifeguards. And so that's pretty good money for a kid when you get to go down to the beach and, you know, surf before work and check out girls during the day and rescue people and then go back and surf after work. So You couldn't be hired till you were 16. And I was a late uh, birthday. So my end of my sophomore year, I was still 15 and a half. And I wouldn't be 16 till October. So I missed that whole summer. 
But I said to the guys that I knew, I think I'd like to go down there and try out anyway at 15 and a half, just to see how I'll do for the next year. And sort of get that, that, that uh, lay of the land. So they said, great. And I said to my mom, mom, will you take me to the beach after school? And she said, only if you get your grades up. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. So my mom began to drive me to the beach after school. And I began to find out where the trials were gonna be held and look at the tides and look at the currents and look at the waves and high tide and low tide and what it was gonna take because what we knew was most of the guys that were trying out were pool swimmers mm -hmm. and pool swimmers are not ocean guys, no. completely different breed. So I was an ocean guy who was a pool guy. And I thought if I can get smart enough, I could out Fox these guys or I could out think these guys. And so I went down and, and worked out a lot, high tide, low tide, big waves, small waves, a lot of white water, blah, blah, blah. When the game, when the, when the morning came, it was a Saturday morning. It was really, really cold, foggy. You couldn't see the end of the pier. It was so close to the fog. And you show up with your Speedos and that's it. You know, no goggles, no fins. You just show up. Foggy, cold morning. And there probably were 75 guys that showed up. They showed up from UCLA and UCI and San Diego State. And um, then the high school, the junior colleges and then the high schools, all these kids for probably about 10 slots each summer about 10 lifeguards did not come back from the previous year for going off to college or whatever it was. So um, when the thing started, um, I lined up way off to the left on purpose because I knew that the tide was going really strong south to north. Mm -hmm. And if you wind up directly on the buoy way out at the end of the pier, you, you drift off. So you have to get on an angle and go to it. Anyway, as it turned out, I ended up getting three, um, I got two firsts and a third out of those 75 guys. And I was underage, I was 15 and a half. And all the people went nuts, like, who is that? Or how could he do that? Or who is that kid, you know? And my lifeguard guys went nuts because they thought hard work was beating better talent. And what happened was I was interviewed as the first interviewee, getting two firsts. And they said, what's your deal? Who are you? Where'd you come from? And I said, you know, I swim with those guys. And I came down here and um, practiced a lot to figure this thing out. And I, um, you know, I figured out I could body surf past the faster swimmers if I got the right wave. So anyway, um, they said, you're too young. And I said, I know. I said, I did it for next year because you weren't going to hire me. And they said, okay. And then that next Thursday, I got a phone call from them at home. And the phone call was, would you like to be a beach lifeguard? And I said, I can't, I'm too young. And they said, no, we called or went to the city manager and the city manager worked on it. We got an insurance waiver to hire a 15 and a whole 15 year old. Wow. So you're in. So I became the first and only 15 year, 15 and a half year old lifeguard to ever get hired for a city. And my, my team, my coaches so embraced the whole win thing because we didn't have all the best talent, but we tried to outwork and outsmart better talent. Ultimately, we put two guys on the Olympic team. And um, then this, my high school coach was a Hungarian Olympian from 1956 in Sydney. Anyway, he left my high school, went to Long Beach State, from Long Beach State, University of Michigan, from University of Michigan, he became the US Olympic coach, swim wow. coach. And he became the US Olympic coach before Bob Bauman, Bowman, who's Michael Phelps coach. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's the, in the lineage of all those guys. And he today still at 83 represents United States swimming around the world. So his Olympic kind of work ethic on a bunch of average kids um, caused us to do stuff that we really probably shouldn't have done. And that's when the light turned on in me that, you know, I'm not the brightest kid. I'm not the sharpest pencil. I'm not the best looking. I'm small, but there is more talent in me than I understand. Mm -hmm. Even though I feel average, I feel somewhat mediocre. I don't stand out. I'm not really as good as the good guys, but if I put my head down and focus, I could probably do things that um, I shouldn't be able to do. Hmm. And that, that changed my world radically because I knew then if I wanted something bad enough and I would focus and commit to it, um, I'd, do, I'd be able to do stuff that um, I didn't know that I could do. Hmm. When it came time for pararescue, I had 
sort of a, a sort of background. I dodged the Vietnam draft. I got my number and um, anybody under 150, you get a ping pong ball. All the kids sat in their, in their living room in America on the same day. And that ping pong ball was picked up by the Department of Defense and read the number. And if you had under 150, you're going to Vietnam, unless you could find some way to get out. So I sat you know, in my little room with my mom and my dad and my sister as the ping pong balls are going back and forth. And boom, boom, you know, they picked my birthday and they gave me the number 149. Um, I didn't have a good way to not go in the military. I, you know, even if you're going to college, they pull you out of college sometimes and, and take you in. So I had a water polo injury. I had a chipped bone in my elbow and I began to smash my elbow into a concrete wall to make that thing mush so it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. When it came time to go with my toothbrush down Wilshire Boulevard in Hollywood to go be inducted to the military, I went with three other friends. And um, at that time, guys were shooting their toes off. Guys were getting, you know, they were walk, taking off all their clothes and walking down the street naked, trying to get arrested for being perverts. Do anything to keep from going in. And sure enough, my elbow did not work that morning. Um, they took x-rays and they said, I said, it doesn't work. And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, no, no, it, it doesn't work. And I showed it to them and put over there and they put me in this thing, x-ray machine. They go, you got a bad elbow. I go, yeah, it's really bad. So, so they said, you have, instead of 4F, which is you're physically disabled, I got a 1Y, and a 1Y was um, only in case of national emergency would you go to, to the military. Um, myself and another friend got out today, or that day, that went home and got drunk. We just, <laughs> you know, like, I can't believe we got out. Our other two friends did go in, and they were dead within a year in Vietnam. Mm. So it was a difficult time. And um, I knew though that at about 2021, I needed to make a major change in my life. I was screwed up. I, I was just not going anywhere. And my, my friends were all progressing and I was partying all the time, and, um, surfing and snow skiing. And I went to college four times, you know, and then I'd quit and go surfing or go to Mexico or do something, you know. I just didn't have any direction or insight Sounds like but you were uh, adopting a little bit of the flower child uh, attitude that at that point, huh? Well, I was I was a little flowery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my first attempt at college was in San Francisco, so oh. I went to San Francisco at sixty nine during the the Love Inn and all mm -hmm. that stuff, and um, you know it was a constant diet of Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and Janis Joplin and. Buffalo Springfield and all these groups that came through, you know, in a big haze. And all those kids tried to stay in college, but there was just a lot going on back then. <laughs> anyway, my, I had some friends who were pararescue reservists and, and pararescue for the listeners. In our day, uh, there were four branches, you know, and it was the, the Army Green Berets, Navy SEALs, it was the Marine Recon and Raiders, and then Air Force was the smallest of them. We were called pararescue. So we did everything that the Navy SEALs did. We trained with the Navy and the Army, but we were combat paramedics. And these guys who were reservists working out of, out of March Air Force Base here, you know, they worked two weeks a year and then one weekend a month. So they would go to college and they would surf and then they'd jump out of planes and mountain climb, scuba dive, to be these paramedic guys and got paid and for that too they said hey you need to come in we're having so much fun dude you are just blowing it <laughs> you need to come in with us we get paid for it you know you get to, you go to rei and you get your equipment and you you know you're just in the game if you if you want to take rescue work like i was you know a lifeguard down a ski patrol <laughs> if you want to take rescue work to the to the top level mm -hmm. you'll become a pararescue and I wasn't big on the military and it was Vietnam, but I knew that I really respected these guys. They were different. They were focused. They were, um, they were, they were smart. They accomplished a lot. And I just said, I need to change my life and get my act together. And I like the kind of product that these pararescue guys modeled. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you need to come in. And I said that same average thing. I said, I don't think I can do it. 
I don't think I have it in me. I mean, I don't think that I'm that good of an athlete to make it. And they again said to me, like the coach, if you do what we say and you go dark for like six months, no chicks, no parties, no nothing. You go dark and you train and you train the way that we tell you to train, you can make it. And I remember saying, you know, I really don't have faith that I can make it, but if you have faith in me, then I'll have faith in your faith in me. Because <laughs> I don't have a lot of faith in me, but if you say so. So went ahead and said, okay, and I trained for six months. I just went dark and just said, what do I got to do? And they kept saying, do more of this and do more of this and more of this. It's going to be the biggest mental beatdown. And I, I thought, mental beatdown? I thought it was a physical beatdown. They said, no, it's a mental beatdown way before it's a physical beatdown. Mm-hmm. So how do you train for a mental beatdown? So they, they <laughs> get they, beat they, down. <laughs> they said, um, you're never going to hear as many F-bombs in your life. You're never going to be told how stupid you are more. You're never going to be told that you're crap. You can do nothing. You're an embarrassment. They're, they want to get in your head to see if they can crush the reason that you're, you're wanting to do this. They want to know if they can ever get you to quit because they cannot allow quitters in the career field because people are, are banking their lives that you will not quit on them. Mm-hmm. That whatever it takes, you will get to the guy or the lady and you'll rescue them and you'll get them out. So our job was to get in during combat, rescue the Navy SEAL, the Army Ranger, the Marine, and do what we got to do to keep them alive and then escape and evade and get them out. Mm-hmm. So the mantra was, you would rather die with your patient than come out by yourself. You don't quit. Mm-hmm. And so they have to smoke out. They have to, they have to find who the quitters are. And they're going to do everything possible to give you a reason to quit. Mm-hmm. So you need to know it's a game. And they're going to try to crush you. And I thought, okay. And I just thought, I'm going to have to train to be crushed. And then I would say to these guys, talk to me about what crushing looks like. And they would explain in the water or in the dirt or in the sand or in PT or whatever it was, the mental side of wanting to, to crush your why. Can we get inside your head and make you want to quit? So I went in and uh, there was 150 of us in our class as most of the time, Navy SEAL guys, about 150 Army Rangers, uh, Air Force, we have about 100, 150 guys start. And um, when we finally got into our pipeline, which was nine months later of training, there were about seven of us left. And uh, then they had other guys that were rollbacks, the guys who were from other classes that were hurt that got well and they were added to our class. I think we graduated 16. And at the very end, they made me team leader. And I went, whoa. And I just thought, and, and when, this, when the seven of us were there at the end, we looked at each other and just said, where are all the good guys? <laughs> where, where, are the, where are the perfect athletes that were here in the beginning who were saying, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, you know, and they'd been top notch this and top notch that. And, you know, they'd done all these sports or got all the awards and they were all gone. Wow. Because when you're, when you're at the top, you get used to being at the top. Mm-hmm. But when you're not at the top anymore, you can lose your confidence because you don't know who you are because you're not the, you're not the stud anymore. You're not the one that everybody's raving about. And it gets in your head when you've been Mr. All-America or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And then all of a sudden, you're just another guy that's being crushed. And if, you're, if you haven't learned to be scrappy, if you haven't learned from the, like the book Grit, Angela Duckworth's book, if you haven't learned how to stay in and be a fighter, you'll get crushed easily because you just don't know who you are when you're not any good. Mm-hmm. You're just another normal guy, average guy. And it's their goal, the instructor's goal, to make every super athlete get crushed so that they can find out what's in his head to find out if he can make a comeback and become a team guy. Mm-hmm. And if you take care of others, they'll take care of you versus you being this, this superstar. And they're all the rest of the guys just look at you. 
Mm-hmm. So the sad part is they look at the really exceptionally good athletes and they say, they're the ones that we're going to go after the hardest mm-hmm. because we'll see what's in their head. And so we were average guys and all those other really good guys somewhere along the line said, I don't like this anymore. I'm done. I don't, I didn't sign up for this. It's too hard. And I quit. And it was an interesting, again, experience to say, we trained before we went in in such a way that when the instructors came after us, they couldn't rock our world. And we liked them trying. I remember uh, it was a hot August kind of a day or a hot, hot Texas day, about 90 degrees, you're in fatigues, you're out there on the hot, stiff grass, you know, in uh, San Antonio at Lackland Air Force Base. And my instructor came to me and he got on one knee and I'm in a plank position, just sweat rolling off my head, you know. And he just goes, hey, Owens. Yes, Sergeant, you know. You know why I'm here? No, Sergeant, I don't. He says, I'm here to crush you. And I remember, look, he was right up to my face. And I go, thank you, Sergeant, for crushing me. I appreciate it, Sergeant. <laughs> and he said, he said, do you know why I'm going to crush you, Robert? I said, no, Sergeant. He said, because I like you. I said, well, thank you, Sergeant, very much. He said, and so I need to develop you. I need to teach you that you can do more than you think and that you are uncrushable. So I'm going to crush you. I said, thank you so much, Sergeant, for crushing me. And he said, so, and I'm going to crush the class. And I want you to know, um, I think you can make it. I said, well, thank you very much, sir. And he proceeded to make our lives miserable, you know. And you learn to be, you learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You learn to be miserable. And it's not, it's not terrible. You're just miserable. Mm-hmm. And once you gain, gain that confidence that, Someone is trying to develop this potential in you that you don't know is there, but you hope it's there. Then you almost appreciate what they put you through because every day you're growing a little bit more, a little bit more. I can do more than I thought. I can get faster, bigger, stronger every day. And I never thought I could do what I'm doing now. Did you look at it more as a, as a, as a challenge or sure. was it, or, or was it a, a growth thing or, 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 or what? Because, you know, when, when, when the sergeant comes to you and says, I'm going to crush you, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, try it, mister. You know, you can't crush me sort of thing. And other times it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you, you know, so I'm just kind of curious when it hits you and that thought process, which, which way were you swinging on it? You know, mine, mine, was not, mine was not cocky like, okay, try it. Yeah. I knew he could. I knew that if he wanted to turn up the, the, the notch on this thing, uh, none of us would make it. Mm-hmm. So um, I wasn't like, hey, I dare you to try to crush me. I was just like, oh, God, you know, I'm up for the challenge, but I hope to God I can, I can do this thing. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an interesting sort of thing because you know I think back to uh, airborne school, which was you know not that hard, really. Uh, anybody that tells you the the modern airborne school, not the not the World War II airborne school. Uh, but I just always remember a couple of guys. I think it was uh, I think there were Marines that were there in my class. You know, and it's three hundred some odd people, and the pass rate is probably ninety percent or something like that. But there was a handful of Marines that were always just like, you know, go ahead. <laughs> you know, you can't hurt me there, uh, black hat sort of thing. So in a much different fashion, I think that was more of a, that was a different kind of game. I don't, I think the Marines were challenging the black hat to see what, see what four or two they had kind of flipping the, flipping the trail on that. So we sort of, we sort of did the same thing. We, we did 13 weeks of um, PT. Why? Because the Air Force didn't know what to do with this because it was, it was at the end of Vietnam. Mm. And they said, what do we do with this class? So we're going to keep you here because we don't know what to do with you. And some guys quit just then. we had been nine weeks of, of eight hours a day, you know. And then uh, guess what, you guys? We're staying here indefinitely until the Air Force figures out what to do with you. Some guys just went, I can't mentally do indefinitely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, was, I got the nine weeks and 
it's got to be over. <laughs> anyway, so we ended up doing 13 weeks. And we were in such good shape um, that we broke all these records, <laughs> these pararescue long records on the board, you know, oh, because yeah, yeah. they just kept saying, well, if you're going to stay here, you might as well get faster. <laughs> let's, let's break this record. Let's break this record, this record. And all of us as a class had to try these records, you know, and see who's going to break them all. What else are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Anyway, we got to, we got to jump school right afterwards and we were just like bring it you know we felt like you can't touch us and so we got in there with these army guys and there was a couple navy guys mainly army guys and these army officers thought they were hot you know they just who are you enlisted guys and we just said we don't think you're nothing (laughs) we we think you're a jerk and so they'd pull rank on us we said what are you going to do to us you know what do you, what, what, so we then said, you either shut up, Captain, or we're going to get in trouble on purpose to, to, to make your life miserable. And he said, you can't talk to me like that. We said, we just did. And so we started, you know, we had run around singing your songs. We didn't get to run around the pack doing the, as we're singing the songs. So everyone else is in line, but we're running or doing circles around them. And then we'd say to the instructor, something on purpose to get in trouble. And, you know, we'd have to do 50 push-ups or 100 sit-ups or something, you know. And we'd look at that captain and you'd say someone would say, let's get in trouble again. And we got in trouble again. And we said, captain, if you're smart, you'll shut up. Don't mess with us. We'll make your life miserable. This is nothing compared to what we've come through. And finally, the captain said, uncle, you guys just do whatever you want to do. I won't talk to you. We said, good, leave us alone. Go play army. <laughs> and, we, we, and the instructors, the black hats, they just looked at us and said, you know, there's some groups you just don't want to mess with. <laughs> you just, they come in a much better shape than you are, you guys. It was really fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a hell of a leadership lesson there for those guys, right? <laughs> you got to carry that forward, definitely. You know, there's, you can lead by rank or you can lead by example. Mm-hmm. And when some guy only is a leader because he's got something on his shoulder, but he doesn't have the stuff on the inside, it... There, there are guys that resent guys who don't have the goods, but they got the position. Yep. And the lowest level of leadership is positional. Mm-hmm. You know, just because you got the corner desk in some building, just because you got the title, doesn't mean that people like you. Doesn't, pe- doesn't mean that people respect you. And so if that captain would have said, hey, guys, I want to be friends. I want to work with you, blah, blah, blah. You know, he showed some leadership there, but he just said, you see this thing on my shoulder? You're going to do what I say. And we said, okay, bring it. And we just made his life miserable. Well, and I think one piece of, uh, one piece of, other piece of that leadership that is, you know, really important, of course, is the ability to build trust with your team. And that's one thing I, I that really stood out to me as you're going through this uh, with your swimming coach and then, you know, with other people along the lines is trusting the person who knows more than you. And I think that, you know, if you talk about things to take from being a student, you know, dad, you always told me when I was playing rugby, be a student of the game. When you're a student of something, you're trusting the person up there, accepting that you don't know anything or you don't know very much and that they know a lot and that you're going to do what they tell you because you're trusting them that they can put, put, make you into the best product that you could be. And I think that that's a really, really big thing. And, you know, I, I, I got to tie it into my rugby world because that's what I do every time y'all start talking military for too long. <laughs> no, no, listen, 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 listen. So I played rugby in Alaska. I played rugby for a city team in Tulsa. I broke my right leg against the University of Kansas. And I broke my, my right wrist against the University of Arkansas. So I like rugby. I love it. We're rugby family. That's always We're good. Rugby family. <laughs> well, oh, I got to go off on another segue then because you were talking about water polo. And I know I'm a rugby guy and people always say rugby is the tough sport. Water polo is one of the few sports I look at and go, how the hell does anybody get up in the morning and go do that? It looks like it is so freaking hard. And I would love if you could draw a little quick comparison between water polo and rugby and maybe that mental toughness between the two there. Completely different mental toughness, completely different thing. In the water, you have to, you have to become water savvy. Rugby, mm-hmm. you got to be rugby savvy. In the water, you either develop your lungs and your, your resiliency because it's soccer in a swimming pool. You always do back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Once you get that down and you own that, then you don't have to worry about your confidence because you're in the kind of shape that can handle swimming back and forth, back and forth the whole game. 
Mm-hmm. Rugby is a different world because you get hurt in rugby with glancing blows. Football is head on. Rugby is glancing blows, you know. And once you get used to running and tackling correctly, you like to get hit or you like to hit. <laughs> and there's nothing better than a clean hit mm-hmm. and then rolling over and getting the ball out, you know. And, and so it, it's a, we don't have contact per se in water polo, but we do. Mm-hmm. You can't see it because it's all underwater. So oftentimes, you know, you get out of the pool and you don't have any Speedos on it, but you have these red scratch marks down your back and they go under your Speedo and then down your leg where some guy is scratching you, you know, but you know, you can't see it because from the neck down. Right. But in, in rugby, it is a violent thing and you like to hit people and you like to tackle people. And it's a, it's a, um, it's, they're both competitive. They're just mm-hmm. so, so real different. Actually, um, water polo was really, really hard, but the toughest thing I ever did was row crew. Ooh, and okay. crew, those, those big long boats, you know, in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And the reason is in crew, you have to have maximum strength, but you have to have perfect balance. And so you cannot just be a stud that's strong. You have to be one that is lining up with the guy's head directly in front of you mm-hmm. and the head in front of him and the head in front of him. Otherwise the boat will, will go like this. So oh, if, wow. if, and we'll, you can't pull the oar if your oar is buried in the water. Mm-hmm. So in, in crew, when the guy says, give me a power 20, you reach out and you pull it, but you have to have perfect balance and you can't drop a shoulder. And it's really hard technically to give all that you have and yet be perfect in your, in your technique or else the, the boat goes like this. Oh yeah. I could imagine, you know, that makes me think of, uh, honestly, it takes me to my, my physical therapy for my back injury and dad, I bet you could relate to this. How many of the exercises you do with a back injury are just basic things. And it's like, okay, well, can you do it with your back straight? And can you do it without dipping a shoulder down or those type of things? And it's freaking hard. And I do it with 10 pound weights. I can only imagine rowing a boat. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's an amazing thing to watch them start training people on how to do their shoulders and how to keep their head and where to go when you're on the slide forward and the slide coming back. And it takes a lot of practice for the balance. So you can't be strong if you're wrecking the boat because you're out of balance. So you have to be weaker so, so you can learn how to do it and then see if you can add strength to the technique all the time. Mm. It's a head trip. I mean, we have a thing, we had a thing called an ergometer and that's a rowing machine. And you see them today, today mm-hmm. rowing machines this way. We used to have them with one arms because I was in a boat. And we'd see guys, um, pass out, fall off the machine, just boom, <laughs> just lose it because the coach is putting more weights on it, going more, <laughs> more. <laughs> it just uh, it drops more weight on the wheel, you know, <laughs> and just go, no, you have seven minutes, ready, set, go, boom, you know, and um, it's just a head game to try to keep mm-hmm. that kind of strength, but, but perfectly aligned, and everyone in the boat knows when you screw up. And the guy who's sitting in the front, the coxswain says, seven, what's wrong with you? Seven, six, get it up. Here we go. Five, what are you going to do? Five, you're screwing up. Come on, five, get your oar out of the water. And you're trying with all your heart to pull the thing, but your technique's going because you're tired. Right. Anyway, it's, it's a head trip. Hmm. I, lo- I love that rabbit hole. I'm glad we went down that. <laughs> I, I like rugby. I'm glad you're a rugby guy. Yes, sir. Well, we got, I got to ask this it, because I'll forget for later. What position did you play? I was outside. Outside, okay. All right, all right. So not quite one of the pretty boys, but you're you're still you're still you still checking your hair and stuff. <laughs> Occasionally, every once in a while, but you know, once every twenty minutes, the ball would finally make it to me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. And it takes all fifteen of them, all right? It, yes, it does. It takes all fifteen. There you go. There Unless you're playing good sevens. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Whole nother. All that's your, that your question. My life is gaining confidence, Mm -hmm. thinking that I'm average, think I'm a mediocre, somebody believes in me, I submit to them, I do what they say, and then I find out that I can do more than I think I can do. Was there a was there a point uh, at any point, you know, across uh, military or sports or anything like that where you felt like you had that intrinsic confidence? Uh, you know, where it was one coach that finally got it into you like, hey, you know what? I am kind of badass. I am pretty darn good at this. I am great at this, whatever it is. Or was it something where it was kind of always a continual, um, I hate to say self-doubt, but something to where you were always questioning if you had that kind of ability? You know, once I got through pararescue training, 
um, I had gained a confidence that um, I didn't think I was a badass. I just thought I can weather most storms. Mm. You know, I, I, I have found a way to stay in the game and compete when others quit. Now, if you call that badass, you know, I mean, guys like to think that they're badass, you know, mm. or they like to think that they're, they're studly or something, but the game is really in the head. And when we train Navy SEAL candidates today, when I train Air Force Special Warfare candidates today, and it was said to me also, this whole thing is 80% mental. It's 20% physical. But most young people think it's 80% physical. Mm -hmm. But the mind will always quit before the body will. And so if you haven't learned to develop your mind, and what we teach is what is called emotional maturity. Most young people are emotionally immature. Mm -hmm. they do stupid things they don't think through stuff they're not big picture folks they don't know how to get through the pressure that's coming at them and so they do immature things and you can't do that when you're on a team when people's lives are at stake so we looking back this is what they did to us but mm -hmm. we try to take 18 to 30 year olds and say you cannot think the way you've been thinking any longer if you're going to work for us and you're going to save lives, you're going to be on the front lines with your team and say, we have to teach you to never become emotionally immature. Mm -hmm. We need to teach you how to become mature, which means we have to teach you how to think through the process of being miserable or tired or overwhelmed. Because mm -hmm. most of the time in combat, you'll be overwhelmed. You'll be tired. Your heart's going to be jacked up. You're going to have an adrenaline rush. You're going to be, uh, out of breath and it's hard to make good decisions when you're out of control here's something that you might like i haven't said this much to any of the other podcasts but i was on a naval special warfare um uh, there's a group that we used to meet in coronado once a month the the, the buds commandants um the retired bud commandants olympic coaches psychologists psychiatrists all these guys would come and we'd be working on this thing of how can we develop a better young person, a more emotionally mature young person. And it was interesting, this one Navy SEAL instructor said that the issue is we know these kids are good athletes, but we also know they're frail. And the, the, the um, definition of frail, fragility, is easily broken, easily, uh, um, easily, uh, what's the other one? Easily broken, uh, unusual abilities to uh, not think well, um, and a few others. And the, and the point of that being today, of course, when I bring it up, I can't remember. But the point is that we need to knock people around mm -hmm. mentally. You may be good physically, but can you be knocked around out of your comfort zone for day after day after day without you losing it and making a bad mistake? Mm. So I think it's real interesting that, that in life, we all get knocked around. Finances, relationships, children, bad bosses, job changes, getting laid off. And the question is, are you able to not be frail, easily broken, easily um, manipulated by circumstances? Can you think good in those pressure moments and situations? Mm -hmm. And we try to work with young people and say to them, we're gonna put you in situations where you will, we will on purpose overwhelm you. And we're not gonna let you think right. And then we're going to find out if you can then think right when we know you shouldn't be able to think right. Because mm -hmm. you have a team and they're looking for a leader who's not going to get them killed. Example, we put kids into hypothermia. Hypothermia where they're shaking and they're colder than they've ever been. So we'll put them in and out, in and out of the Pacific, rolling around the sand all night long, in the water, out of the water, in the water, out of the water where they're just, 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 just losing it. To see if they can think clearly when they're out of their mind or they can only think clearly when they're in their mind. Mm -hmm. 
We know who you are when your mind is good. We don't know who you are when your mind is out of whack and we give you leadership decisions. So we, there's an ambulance right over here. We're not going to kill you, but we're going to take you into a zone of pain where we need to see who you morph into during that pressure to see if you can make good decisions or if you'll become selfish, self-centered, mm-hmm. all about you, survival, tech with the rest of the team. They want to know what you do when you're out of your mind. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's such a huge win because when I got out of pararescue, they had put me in places where I was, I was out of my mind. You know, like <laughs> I'm tired. I can't think. And they say, now think, <laughs> how are you going to do this? How are you going to get this IV in? How, which drug? What's the ratio of drugs? You Phenogren, epinephrine, you know, morphine. What, what, what are your ratios, weights and balances? And I, I'm in the Arctic. I'm doing, I'm sticking guys with IV needles at 20 below zero. Well, how do you do that? Because the fluid freezes. Well, what are you going to do when you're shaking and the guy's going blue because he's frozen and you get, have to get an IV and you can't find a vein and you don't want to be there because you're just really cold yourself. Mm-hmm. And then how are you going to stick that line down through your clothes and down into your glove and through your glove so it has to stay warm otherwise it'll freeze and you have to hold that guy. And can you think on your feet? Can you find a way to win in the spur of the moment? And that's the kind of stuff that they teach you so that when you say you feel you're badass, no, but you feel like I can do stuff. I mean, I, I, I can figure this thing out. I'm in the game. And that's the kind of confidence that carries with you the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. What, what, with all this, you know, and mental focus, I, I'm, I'm curious, how do you handle the injury? You know, because we all are doing all these things and I, and I know all throughout all these accomplishments and achievements that you've done and races and, and mount, you know, climbing and all these different things and pararescue, what, how do you handle the re- injury recovery? Because that's a that's a hell of a mental blow because it's completely outside of your control, mm-hmm. and so how how do y'all address how do you address that? Athletes get hurt, get over it. You know, yeah. just it, it just you have to look it in the face, say you know if you're going to be an athlete, you're going to get hurt, and so if getting hurt is the big discourager to you, and you mentally go in the tank because you get hurt then you'll be out of the game quickly because you'll be hurt maybe most of your life. Mm-hmm. You can't play with that fear. You can't play. Yeah, it's like, it's just another just another adventure for me to embrace. Like when I was training for Kokoro, this, you know, I did that Navy SEAL Hell Week at 50 years old or at, at uh, 66 years old. And I'm the oldest guy to ever do that Navy SEAL Hell Week thing. And, um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm six months into my training and I blow up my shoulder. My shoulder pops out. I'm doing box jumps and I trip over the box, wooden box. I try to break it and hit my elbow and shoulder pops out, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And I knew the moment I fell over the box, I tore my shoulder. And so I went to the doctor a couple of days later. He said, yeah, you're, you're messed up. You need surgery. I, I had to fight at 66 years old. Wow, this sucks. I've just torn my shoulder. I can't do a push up for six months. What am I going to do for six months as I'm going to lose all my gains that I've got from my training. And um, I, I had to think it through like, okay, this will either make you or break you. Mm-hmm. Just like COVID, COVID will make the, make it, you'll, the better side of you will come out during COVID or the worst side of you will come out during COVID. The things, pressure brings uh, people into new places. And I just said, okay, I'm gonna put my arm in a sling and I'm gonna work on core and I'm gonna work on legs for six months until mm-hmm. I can do a quick job. And I said to the guys, I'll see you in six months. I have to drop out of my training. Uh, I got to get my shoulder fixed. So I went dark again and worked by myself every morning and worked on my core and stuff. So when I got my arm back, um, I came back and said, hey, I said, I got my arm back. I can do a push-up again. I can do a pull-up again. I trained all the way till three weeks before the event. Wow. Three weeks before the event, I was doing a MRF. You know what the MRF is? Mm-hmm. I was doing my weighted MRF with my, with my weight vest. And I got my arms too far out and I felt my other shoulder tear. Oh. Went, no, I got, I got Kokoro 50 hours in three weeks. And I said, now, what am I going to do? This one's just surgically repaired. Now this one's torn and I'm going to have to do a MRF after 10 hours of PT about midnight at night. And how am I going to do my push-ups 
for those of you who don't know what the Murph is, Murph is a mile run, and that's 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, and 300 air squats, and then a mile run for time. And they give you a time that you have to do it with a weight vest on. And um, when we did it- It's, it's named it after uh, uh, Lieutenant Murphy. I don't know Michael's first name. Michael Murphy. Michael Murphy, thank you, thank you. Medal of Honor winner, Navy SEAL. Right, right. Anyway, when I headed into Kokoro with a torn shoulder, um, I couldn't tell anybody because I didn't want people to know that I'm screwed up. And so I had to find a way to, to do new angles to get through that. The point being is that um, you get injured, life, life happens. And so if, if you're gonna let a setback get in your head, then you're weak. You, you haven't thought right. Athletes get hurt, find a way to win. And so many folks are easily collapsed. They're, they're easily fragile. They're, they, they just can't handle the mental pressure but if they had been with somebody who could train them how to get through this stuff, um, little bit by little bit, the confidence comes. And I was fortunate because I've been carrying that kind of confidence since my 20s. Mm -hmm. Because in my 20s, I had learned, hey, dude, they're going to crush you and you're going to be hurt. And if the Taliban is, is chasing you, they're not going to say, oh, time out. Are you hurt? We won't chase you anymore. <laughs> the Al Qaeda, ISIS, they're not going to say, oh, the guy's hurt. We're so sorry. You know, they're going to say, get him now. Well, he's weak. And so you've got to think through how to do these things. And it's nice that you've learned early on or sometime in life where you've, you've submitted yourself to somebody mm -hmm. and say, take me through this and I can learn how to press through the things that most people quit at. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun to see a young person get it or even adults. You know, I, I, Dad, before you go, I just have to throw in the quick story. You might remember this one. Uh, do you remember Casey Rock? Played for Glendale for a while, uh, was a lock there, about 6'10", huge guy. So uh, one of my first rugby camps, I remember he was on crutches, and he was talking about how he had broke his leg and was in the round crunches, crushes. Ugh. And this is a lock who thought never had to pass the ball, especially older rugby. You know, new age, there's a little bit more going on, but I don't have to pass the ball. I just go run and hit people. And the only thing he could do while his leg was broken was lift upper body and pass the ball. And he was out for, I think he told me it was eight or 10 months that he was out where he couldn't play, couldn't practice, couldn't do anything. And all he would do is just sit there on his crutches and just pass the ball back and forth. And he came out with this amazing pass afterwards because he, just like you, he recognized, look, I can't do this, but I need to take this opportunity to do something else. And so I have to work that story in because I don't know how many times I've told that to kids I coach because it's like, dude, just drill your passing. Like, it's, it's not that hard. Even if your leg's broken, you can drill it and you can get a lot better if you work hard at it. <laughs> really good story. Really good. Uh, and and it's, it's just so true. Mm -hmm. it, it is. And man, there, there's just so much. And, and what I'm what I'm, what I'm hearing more uh, again <laughs> uh, is this, this, this passion that, well, there's, there's two things I'm hearing and I'm having a hard time coming up with which question now that, now that I get my turn, Camden, uh, which question I get to ask, because I got a couple of them, you know, it's, I'll go back to my original one that I had is how does the sense of adventure continue to, fill you up because I can see that, you know, what's the next thing. So I'm, I'm curious about that, you know, that sense of adventure. How is it, how does it continue to burn in you? You know, we're all wired and gifted differently. And I don't know the way or why I'm wired the way I am, but I'm wired that I like challenges. I like wondering if I could, as David Goggin says, what if, you know, all my life I've had what ifs. I wonder if, I wonder if I could pull this off. I wonder if I could really do that. I like that kind of challenge. And I, I like then the, the journey of the training to do what most people say I shouldn't try or attempt. And that for me, I don't know why. Um, you know, I went to college five times. <laughs> when I finally got my head squared on, hey, college wasn't so tough. I said, they said, are you going to go back and actually finish this time? I said, yeah, no problem. Because <laughs> you guys don't, nobody thought I could do it after four. And so when they told me I couldn't do it, I went and did it, got my best grades and graduated. And people said, you actually went back to college. Well, you told me I couldn't. <laughs> you told me I shouldn't. <laughs> you told me, you know, blah, blah, blah. So each of your listeners has giftings and talents. And 
they need to find out why they're wired the way they are. But for me, I like that. I wonder if, and most of the time I find, I drift to things where people say, don't do that. I mean, you shouldn't attempt that. <laughs> don't you know how old you are? Don't you know this or don't you know that? And there's just something inside me that says, tell me again, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to put your face in it. You know? So that's, I, that's how I've always been since I gained confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, and, and where did that, where did that gain confidence happen? Where was that a uh, pair of rescue? Was, was that the moment? You know, all those things, that high school thing, the lifeguard mm -hmm. thing, the pair of rescue thing, you know, I got out of pair of rescue and again, um, nobody knew who pair of rescue was. They know Navy SEALs, they know Rangers, Green Berets, you know, but who's, who's the air force, you know? And so, um, I read that Sports Illustrated, that really famous 1979, May 18th, 1979 Sports Illustrated article about some stupid, crazy, don't even try it event. It was in, they, they covered year two of Iron Man in Honolulu. And they said, these crazy guys, and they wrote this big article, these crazy guys are going to do the three toughest races in Honolulu in one day. And the goal is to see who's the fittest person, the swimmer, the bike guy, or the runner. And when I read that, the kind of people that showed up, I'm sitting in my college dorm in that fifth attempt going to college. And I'm on my bed and I'm reading my Sports Illustrated, my SI, like we used to do back then. And when I read that thing, I said, I can do that. That's not that tough. I'm a pararescue guy. I'm a beach lifeguard. Bring it, you know? And so the more I went around to the dorm and said, hey, read this. And they go, that's stupid. Hey, don't do that. I mean, who would do that? I just went, oh. I think, I think for year three, Bob, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try this thing. Well, how are you going to train? Like for pararescue? I'm going to go put some ankle weights on start running miles, you know? I'm going to, I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Anyway, when I got over there for year three in Honolulu and did the 1980 Ironman, when everyone told me, don't try, it's impossible, don't do it, you got to be stupid. It was just another one of those those things at 27 years old where I went, these guys are right. There's more talent in all of us, but we get scared. We hang out with mediocre people, average people, and they help us dumb down our world to their, their level. When there's potential in arts and science and speaking and math and athletics, there's, there's so much talent inside, buried inside of young people that's untapped because they hang around the wrong people. And I, when I work with young people, I say, you know, winners will hang with winners and losers hang with losers and excuse minded people will find other excuse minded people to comfort them. And I say, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And so it's, it's so true that if I will hang around people who say you can, I'll try. And if I hang out with people who say you shouldn't try, I have to make a decision to stop spending time with them and go find people who say you can, because people will always dumb down your world to their level. And that's why you got to be careful who you're around and who you listen to, because your people who are listening to this, as well as your son, he's so gifted and so smart, so capable, can do so many things, but he's got to be around the right encouragers. Otherwise he will give up because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And everything that we want is outside of our comfortability and everything we want is always hard. And, and the life is in the journey of the struggle. Hmm. You know, that kind of reminds me of uh, the, the book, uh, not the art of war, but the war of art. And uh, they talk so much about resistance in that. And the idea that resistance is this you know feeling that you get, it's anxiety, it's stress, it's all that kind of stuff, but it's always towards something that is meaningful to you you feel the most resistance when it's something that you actually care about, when it's something you actually want to do, that's when you feel the most resistance. And I think people, we grow up and we think it's almost the opposite. It's kind of a, you know, we think of it the other way around. It's kind of counterintuitive that if you're passionate about something, it'll always come easy. It'll be easy to wake up in the morning and go do it. And that I think that's not necessarily true because there's so much that goes into that journey and what that really looks like. And that's where that resistance builds up and people can feel it, but you're always going to feel the most resistance when you're working towards something that you're really passionate about. That's right. That's right. It's a great thought. Um, Goggins says, you know, every day do something that you don't want to do. 
every day embrace the suck and do something that's hard and uncomfortable because it'll build you mentally mm -hmm. to a place where you gain that confidence and you gain that, that discipline over a lazy mind that says, I'm not going to let this brain limit me. I'm going to think my thoughts versus these thoughts that are in my brain. And I'm going to change the way I think. And I'm going to find the passion in the journey. And every day when I take on a challenge, I struggle, I'm going to be a better person for it at the end. Mm. And most people don't want struggle in their life. They want life to be easy and, and comfortable. But life is not supposed to be comfortable. And life is not supposed to be easy. Life is supposed to be a journey of overcoming and doing more than you think you can. So you can say, aha, I did it. Everybody wants to win every day, but no one wants to struggle. So I work with young people and I say, you need to struggle today. What is it that you don't want to do? Is it your homework? Is it say goodbye to a friend? Is it go work out? Is it, what do you, what is it you don't want to do, but you know you need to do and you'll mature and grow up if you embrace it and do it versus living how you feel. And that's the journey and that's the struggle and that's where the payoff is. And everybody should have a win at the end of every day where I didn't eat that donut today or I didn't smoke that cigarette today or I didn't lose my temper today or I, or I forgave today. You know, I did something I didn't wanna do and I'm glad ultimately that I didn't follow my feelings. I did what was right for me and for them. I think that's awesome. And, and, and I love that. You know, it's one of the things that I always talk about is celebrating it too. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you did it, right? You did that one little thing and build on that because success breeds success. And right. I think that's such an important thing that, that people forget about, you know, that they're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I did that. Well, no, celebrate the damn thing. You did it. You did it. You know, whether it was, you know, I only smoked three cigarettes today and I usually smoke five. Damn yep. good. Damn, damn good. Right. That's Move right. Forward with that and see what you can do the next day. Take that next step towards it and celebrate it every time because celebrate the win, celebrate the mm -hmm. successes. Cause there's always something in the day that you did right, that you succeeded at. That was a win. If you look for it. Great thought, Otis. Great thought. And, and I, you know, if you can go from 20 cigarettes to 18, if you can go from 18 to 15. If you can stop eating donuts every day, if you can, you know, if you can, whatever it is that you don't want to do, but you know it's good for you, and you just you choose to take yourself on and rewire your brain, you'll like, it, as you say, success breeds success. And you like that feeling at the end of the day when you've been successful. Mm -hmm. And people, people, um, people want to know that they can be successful. The challenge is if you're waiting for somebody else to do the work for you, you know, you'll be stuck. You've got to do it whether anybody notices or thanks you or, or, or understands it. It's for you to grow up mm -hmm. and to take on uh, your issues and and become stronger mentally. You know, I, I, one of the things that uh, in your life, either well, you always find what you look for. So the, the question is, how do you find that person that says, hey, Robert, I'm going to crush you, but I know you can do it. How, how do you, how did, you know, when you're working with, talking with young people and, and you're giving them this, this great philosophy and understanding, how do they make that shift? How do they find that person? Well, they got to find somebody that they admire for what they're doing, whether it's singing or it's writing or whatever it is. And you need to, in humility, go to that person or someone or group and say, I want to, I want to learn to be like you guys, which is humble. And so most men are not humble. Most men want to be the peacock and look how hot I am, you know, all this stuff. But inside that fake it till you make it doesn't work all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can act like you got it. You have the right positive mental attitude, but you've, you've got to get around the right kind of people that say, okay, well, what do you really want to do? And then are you willing to pay the price? And this is the cost for you to attain whatever level you've chosen to, to strive for. And um, I have had men in my life who I could go to and say, help me. Mm -hmm. And I get asked often about this and I say, I would not be where I am today if I hadn't asked for mentoring and asked for help from people who kick my butt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or struck me. You know, and I think, 
I was just gonna say, I think that's that's very true, and I, uh, it reminds me of a kind of a, a lighter, a more fun uh, statistic that I think represents that. Is uh, it was something along the lines of, you know, who do you think lies most? And the study basically found that young men lie like twenty times a day. And you think like, oh, you know, it's out to get girls or anything like that. No, it's just because we want to look like we know what we're talking about. And so if you mention a book, I'm going to nod and say, oh, yeah, that's a great book. You mention a TV show. Oh, man, I love that TV show. Pulp Fiction's amazing. You know, you're, you're expected to have all these different things. And so people start lying on it because you don't want to be vulnerable. And I think that's just kind of a fun way of painting what you were just talking about there. You're right. Yeah, that's really good. And what we, what we need to know and learn is that we're all insecure. None of us want to be rejected. None of us want to fail. But if you get used to lying all the time, your world of cards will collapse because you can't keep up that lie forever. And so somewhere in your confidence, you've got to to learn that men can ask for help. Mm -hmm. Women can ask for help. It's not unmanly. For me, I don't lose my manhood by saying, you know something more than I do, will you please help me? Or can I take you to lunch? I wanna talk to you, you know, you raise kids better than me. Or you know how to make money and I don't. Or you, you know, you have this and I would like to learn that. And I was doing a podcast at Dodger Stadium with Mark Devine from from SealFit. And um, he was a 22 year Navy SEAL commander who started seal fit which is a crossfit gym designed specifically by the navy for training navy seal guys and we get these guys coming home from war with ptsd and all kinds of issues combat issues and they don't want to ask for help because they're too afraid to let anybody know they have they have issues and mark made the comment to me in this podcast he said the strong guys the confident guys know how to ask for help it's the insecure men who won't ask for help because they don't want to show that they're weak or have an issue. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we are always so encouraged when a man will be vulnerable or a woman and say, this is why I do good. This is why I don't do good. These are my issues. And I'd like to work on them. And I'm telling you, or I'm talking to you about it. Could you give me some advice? Mm -hmm. What we always say is either work on your issues or your issues will work on you. And so, You have a choice to grow up, take responsibility for your stuff. A maturity does not come with age. It comes with the acceptance of responsibility. Mm. And that's some people are more mature at 17 than others have ever been at 70 because they've owned their stuff. And they've said, this is true about me. And this is what I like about me. And this is what I don't like about me. And this is what I want to do to work on the stuff Mm -hmm. inside me. And if you can, if you can learn that, to be open, humble, and vulnerable, not all the time to everybody, mm-hmm. but to the right people at the right time, you can make progress. You can grow. And we have a real difficult time with guys saying, hey, you know, you got a drug issue. Nah, you got a drinking issue. Nah, you know, you got a lying issue. Nah, you got a, you know, whatever it is. And they, but they don't want to admit it's true, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to change that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, we all work through stuff. We all have issues. You know, what that makes me think of is uh, kind of the entrepreneurial side of that. Something uh, I think you see a lot with folks is people who you might have the startup, you might have the good business idea, you might be moving forward with things. And a reason that those people wind up failing down the line is the same type of thing you're talking about. You know, like uh, I'll throw out a decent one. I don't like sales. I don't like accounting that much. I can do it all. I am doing it all. I'm not a fan of it. I don't think I'm that good at it either that is the first people I'm hiring as soon as I can, because I accept that that is a weakness of mine and I want to get someone else to go do it. And the other side of that is then when you bring that person on who has a complimentary skill set to you, you're going to perform at a higher level, but then you can't be afraid that they're going to steal your thunder or anything. You have to stay vulnerable, accept that they're in a different skill set than you and let them go thrive. And then you can, you know, you can thrive yourself. If you sit there and if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to keep your books and you decide that because you're so cocky, you never want to hire an accountant, you're not going to go anywhere. It's, I think it's just that simple. Yeah. I have a little bit different take on that in the sense that I want to hire the, I always spend time with guys that are different in their skill sets than me. 
because mm-hmm. I don't have it, they have it. The challenge also is in an early entrepreneur career <laughs> that you hire people because of their, their, their um, skill sets, but they may not mesh with you personality wise, or they may not mesh with you vision wise. And what I find is after 30 years of business consulting is that oftentimes you get emotionally blackmailed because this person has a skill set that you can't live without. And therefore you put up with all this crap about them because their skill set makes you look golden. And they know that you can't live without them. So they get away with stuff, emotional blackmail stuff. What are you gonna do? Fire me? What are you gonna do? Who's gonna do your stuff? Yeah. So you gotta be careful when you're an early entrepreneur to get advice on the kind of people that you hire to compliment you. And I find that if a guy can survive his first four or five hires, he may make it. <laughs> because usually when you're in your entrepreneur babyhood step, you're just so happy to have somebody come do it. <laughs> oh, will you do it? Oh, good. I can check that box. This guy's going to do it. But oftentimes it doesn't work out as smoothly six months to a year into it. And so if you can help someone who, who wants to protect you and like you to help interview your perspective, other talents with you, mm-hmm. you might be able to see some things that you wouldn't see because you're just zealous to have this taken care of. Right. Make sense? Oh, yeah. I'm glad we rounded out that lesson because now that's a great little, that's a full lesson right there that people can take out. So I always love that. <laughs> well, you know what it makes me, I'm jumping to in that, in, in the, the analogy metaphor sort of sense on that. Is it similar to hiring or drafting the best F- athlete in the NFL draft? Kind of that, you know, I don't necessarily need another wide receiver, but right now that is that on the on the slot, that's the best athlete. Is it is it kind of that that sense? Um, yeah, sure. I, I just think that when I when I tried to birth things in my 20s and my 30s, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what I was strong in. I then drew people to me who said, wow, I like what you do. Mm-hmm. And I just believed in them. And then I'd hire them and I have to fire them. And I go, it just didn't work out the way that I thought it would because I didn't interview correctly because I didn't know how to ask the right questions. And so therefore I should have taken a second rounder versus that first rounder, <laughs> but I didn't do my homework that the guy's talent was so flashy, but he had character issues. Mm-hmm. where the second round guy won't give me any problems, you know, and he'll do what I say. And he'll be a good team player versus this super mouthy, look how good I am kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be great to add something like that to our team? Mm-hmm. It, this is a grandfather talking after hiring and firing lots of people. And I liked them all. And it was, it was always painful to say, I didn't ask you the right questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I just didn't think, I'm sorry. I mean, I like you. Let me tell you, let me tell you all the reasons I like you. And then let me tell you all the reasons I'm going to fire you. And I'm sorry. <laughs> and I hope you and your kids do well. Mm. You know, it's just, it just takes time to learn how to get the right talents to mesh. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'll, I'll bring that back to uh, what we were talking about earlier, as far as like trusting a coach and that type of thing. Uh, one of the one of the things that keeps coming to my mind while we're while we've been talking through this is I think uh, with my time coaching here at uh, U of A for rugby, so you get so many kids. We're we're a top program, top twenty easily every you know every year since I've been here, and uh, that whoa, was way whoa, more whoa, of a brag. Really? That was way more of a brag than I meant for that to be. <laughs> Holy crap! My bad, guys. <laughs> but the uh, we get a lot of all Americans because of that. And, you know, kids from other countries that are really, really good. And I I think it's so interesting to watch them and to see all these kids that got the same star, you know, they got the same award, they got the same rank on their shoulder, whatever it is. And they get out there and you can see which ones are going to fail and which ones are going to really succeed so fast because you start seeing who's coachable. And you can't see that on game film, but you can see it in a practice every time. And it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier of, uh, you know, I'll take uh, Coach Duffy here. He says this all the time. Look, if I'm picking on you, it's because I like you and because I think you can go somewhere. Just like you were saying earlier, Robert, if I'm sitting there critiquing your technique over and over and over again, it's not because I don't like you. If I didn't like you, I wouldn't take the time. I'm there because I think you have something and I'm wanting you to trust me to bring you along that journey. You bet. You bet. And all your listeners hope that they can find someone who believes in them the way coach Duffy would do that mm-hmm. to your guys, you know, it's, it's hard to find somebody who you can align with 
in the different, you know, talents of music, science, you know, government, medicine, sports, to find somebody who can come alongside and they really do press you because they really do like you. And as you mm -hmm. said, where do you find them? You got to go search. You just, you got to keep plugging away. You may have to move out of state, make a phone call, do Zoom calls. I paid a guy a hundred bucks to have lunch with me. I said, would you please have lunch with me? I'll give you a hundred dollars. And he said, and he, was, he was a big gun. And he said, uh, all right, uh, meet me. Uh, I'm in Reno, Nevada. Meet me in San Diego at this restaurant on this day. So I flew down, rented a car, you know, got a crisp, crisp hundred dollar bill. And I said, uh, can I talk to you? I read your book. And he said, yeah, uh, talk away. I'll give you two hours. So we sat in a booth for two hours, you know, and he asked me questions and I asked him questions. And I mean, I just, I had to find a way to win. I had to, mm -hmm. I had to, I had, to, I had to somehow get his attention. He paid for lunch. He said, keep it, kid. You know? <laughs> and, and then he said, if you want to come down and hang out, come down once a month to my staff meetings. And ultimately, I did 10 years with this guy. And my last trip was in Beijing. And you know, I, I, had to, I had to separate myself and be different so I could get around the right people that they would not blow me off as just another wannabe. But I was really serious. I really wanted to try to do this, you know, mm. and most people aren't entrepreneurial in the pursuit of, of experts. And they just hope that they can find someone, but I mean, it takes aggressive entrepreneurship to find the right people for you to speak in your life. Mm. I you know, that, that reminds me is this, uh, one of the things that we do with, with the, the service members are transitioning out that I coach uh, with the honor foundation and the commit foundation is we challenge them to have a thousand cups of coffee so that they can go find those people, those people that are in that career field they're interested in, those people that are that have walked some similar paths or, or whatever to explore and, and learn more about what's out there. And, and you know, you did it with a hundred dollar bill, which is pretty, pretty cool. And that challenge of, of finding those people. And, and the other thing I wanted to I wanted to jump on about that is and this is a little bit broader since getting back to the, the adventure mindset and the adventure challenges, how do you find that next one? You know, you, you've, you've got, you know, a couple of accolades under, underneath your belt. How do you find that next one? It's still a challenge for you. You know, um, as you might expect me to say, my twenties were different than my thirties. My thirties were different than my forties, forties to fifties, fifties to sixties. I'm now 69. And um, each time um, life just has a way of dishing up things. So I'm a senior athlete now. And I have a, I have a, a new adventure. And the new adventure is that after I completed the seven marathons in seven days on seven continents, and I did my 12th Ironman, and then I did Kokoro, that 50 hour Navy SEAL challenge, became the oldest guy to ever do that. I came home and had a heart attack. And um, it was funny, the doc said, you blew an artery. I said, how do you blow an artery? He goes, I don't know, I was gonna ask you, how do you blow an artery? He said, that's like putting too much air in the tire tube, you know, like you pumped it till it popped. He said, what did you do to your heart to make it blow? And I went, uh, which time? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then he said, okay, so he gave me some new stents, you know, and I get back out and then I get COVID. And I get COVID and I go, okay, this is another adventure. Let's ride this sucker, you know, let's see what happens, you know. And I get through COVID and now my lungs aren't the way they used to be. Um, they feel like I would imagine emphysema would feel like. My aerobic, my ability to go a long time at a certain heart rate um, is pretty good. But my anaerobic ability of doing stairs and wall balls and box jumps and all kinds of stuff, um, I get out of breath quicker now. Mm -hmm. So when you say the next one, okay, now um, what am I going to do to try to figure this out for the next segment of my life? If my lungs are permanently scarred, what is it that I can do? Mm -hmm. If my lungs are in transition to get healed, okay, then what's a transition period look like and what am I going to do to, to get my lungs back in shape? So when you say what's the next one, 
I was dealt up the heart attack and the COVID and now I'm reshuffling the deck and I'm saying, okay, what kind of athletic career am I gonna have going into my seventies? And so when you say, what's the next one? I got a few rolling around in my brain. I'm signed up for Ironman uh, Florida next year again. If I can get in the pool and if I can get my lungs back, um, I, I, I'm best in the swim. So if I can get my swim back, I can figure out how to bike and ride. And that's a long-term goal. I have a goal of doing Murph coming up in May again. And I want to see if I can do it with a weight vest uh, and see if I can do that. But I have some challenges on things that I wonder if at 75, I can do this. And I wonder if at 85, I could do this. And so I, I'm laying some foundational goals. I'm just waiting to see how this thing plays out. And I'm patient. This morning, I was thinking I was on the treadmill. I got up early because I knew I was doing this podcast. I'm doing my hour run. Today's my indoor day. Tomorrow's my outdoor day. And I'm in there and I'm, and I'm watching Sports Center or whatever it was, you know, and I'm thinking, what's this next one? This, this next one's got to be a bomb, man. This next one, this next one has to be, did you do that? Yeah, I'm going to train for that. It may take me three years to train or something, but it'll be something. I, I'd like to maybe do the North Pole Marathon. Mm. There's a club and the club is you've done both poles and then you've done every continent. So right now I've done every continent and the South Pole, but I need to, have, you know, I would do a grand slam. I need to get to the North Pole when knocked out. And um, so I'm thinking on that one and, you know, there's something that's fun that people say you shouldn't do it. I say, I know. <laughs> how, how big of a club is that? You know, the, that that seven continents and the North Pole, I think there's like 20 people wow. in the world, something like that. And I was thinking about the guy that hosted him is a guy named Richard Donovan. And he's a crazy guy. I, I emailed Richard Donovan when I hear about the World Marathon Challenge and he doesn't respond. So I emailed him a month later, no response. I'm emailing like the third month later. It finally says, hey, sorry, um, I've been busy. I'm running across South Africa. I mean, South America. I said, you are? He said, yeah, and I don't have cell service all the time. <laughs> so, you know, I'm in a place where I got internet and I'll be done running across South America in like two weeks and then I'll get back to you. Oh, okay. So I look him up. You know, he's run across the United States a number of times. He's run across Europe. He's, he's run the length of South America. And he put together all these crazy marathons for crazy people versus these normal ones. And he's the one that developed this, the 777, seven marathon, seven days. And then he's the one I'll email and say, now how many folks are in that thing? <laughs> what do I got to do? And who's the oldest guy? And you know, <laughs> what records are available to me? And if they're good enough, I may hop at it. Uh, that's, that's awesome. And uh, man, so uh, I want to, before we, before we run out of time here, what's, Tell us about your book. What, what's your book? I know, I know now it's, it's been out for a couple of years now, but now you got Audible, right? Which is... Right. That, the book is called Beyond Average. And that's a funny looking picture. I got a black shirt on with a black background, I think. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's a, it's a book about um, encouraging people that we teach in the teams that there's 20 times more potential in everybody at every age mm -hmm. that we need someone though to bring it out of us. And so this is a book that I've always felt average and normal. And then people say, you're not average. And I find out that I'm not average, but my brain for years just said, you're mediocre and average, but it was a lot. I was just lazy and mm -hmm. I didn't have the right thinking. So anyway, the audio book may be more fun than this one. I'm doing the audio book and I start laughing, hitting my leg. I take a time out and I say, hey, this isn't in the book, but you guys, guess what? I go off on some tangent, you know, I'm getting a lot of folks responding to that. Before I do that, can I, can I um, mention something on this entrepreneurship? Please, please. This isn't for everybody, but this is how I think. If I don't make it happen, it's not going to happen. I can't rely on anybody else. If I'm going to be an entrepreneur, if I'm going to invent, if I'm going to start I have to push all the chips on Vegas on me. Hmm. And then I have to do the proper research and then develop a strategy and then count the cost to pull off what it is that I'm trying to, to start or accomplish. And the reason that I'm talking to you today is because of my entrepreneurship. Not, let me explain. I moved home to take care of my dad uh, for 10 years. My dad, uh, my mom died at 91. My dad was 92. 
And I said to dad, what do you want to do? He says, I want to die at home. I said, okay. I said, what do you want? He goes, I want you to come home and live with me, take care of me. And since I'm an adopted kid, I said, what better way can I honor my dad but to go home and take care of him uh, until he dies? So I took a pause of 10 years. Um, I did a couple Ironmans and I surfed a lot. And I just took care of my dad. My dad lived 101. And so I, I was thinking, yeah, I'll move down with my dad for a year, two, he'll die, you know. Uh, I moved home and he got happy and he got excited. He said, hey, this is fun, you and me. And then he started living, you know. I go, dad, how long are you going to live? He goes, what does it matter? You're, you bought in, didn't you? I said, yeah, but how long are you going to live? I used to have a life, dad. And he goes, well, you'll have a life after I'm dead. And I said, okay. I mean, like, you think you're going to live five? He goes, yeah, I'm going to live to 105. You in? And I go, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> so he said to me, when I die, what are you going to do? And I hadn't been speaking, teaching, consulting. Uh, I'd been in 30 nations teaching, coaching. I mean, everything just shut down to take care of my dad. He said to me, you've got to make a comeback and you're not relevant anymore. The world has passed you by. Who are you going to be when you come back out after I die? And I thought about that, like, I have to reinvent myself because no one knows me. No one ever hears of me. I'm just taking care of my dad. I drop out. And so I begin to think, who do I want to be when I grow up? Who do I want to be post 60? And how do I want to write it? How do I write it? He said to me, he said, you know, at 95, he said to me, if I knew I was going to live 35 years post retirement, when the county forced him to retire, I would have started another career. 35 years. Mm -hmm. He said, life is zero to 30, then 30 to 60, and for now, it's 60 to 90. And you better not let people put you on the shelf post 60. You're still in the game. The, the generations are getting healthier, living longer. And mm -hmm. You don't just fade. So I said, who do I want to come back at from 60 to 90? And I decided I wanted to come back as a senior athlete. I decided I wanted to come back health and wellness. I want to speak a lot on you. Choose how you age. And um, I wanted to do senior athlete things like you, when you Google senior athletes, you know, there's CrossFit games and all kinds of stuff. But how do I do that? So I had to put together a game plan where people would have to talk to me. Why? Because they'd say, who are you? So what would cause people to do that? Mm -hmm. So as I begin to train for Kokoro, the Navy SEAL Hell Week thing, 50 hours, and become the, I found out what the age was, the oldest guy to ever attempt it. I was in the game. I could beat it. And so I then begin to train, and things have a way. Once the train's moving, the car's moving, it's easier to steer. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I had five events that four of which I'd be the oldest guy to ever attempt it. And they said to me, don't show up, you're too old. And I said, bada bing, there it is. <laughs> what if, what if entrepreneur push all your chips in? What if I could do what they've told me is impossible to do and I'd be the oldest guy in the world? I would be, I would be back in the game because people would then say, oh, I've heard of that Robert Owens guy. I want to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And so I spent three years investing in myself with those surgeries and injuries and stuff, getting ready, going to, going to a place to train where they said, don't do it. We're training you. We're going to be at the event. And we still don't think you ought to show up. <laughs> I mean, I'm working out with Navy SEAL instructors who said, Robert, we like you. You don't need to do this. <laughs> We're going to crush you. <laughs> and I go, you heard oh, that before. <laughs> oh no, you know, this is going to be a long day. Anyway, so those three years I was investing in myself. Mm -hmm. And you can't do extraordinary things in a balanced lifestyle. You've got to go dark for a period of time and really focus and do what you got to do so that when you get done, you can go back and live a balanced life. 
And they all say, what'd you do? Well, I went dark and I went imbalanced to focus, to do something impossible. Hmm. So today, after I finished those five things, today I'm on your podcast because I had to have an entrepreneur idea on how to make a comeback post 60 and get back out in the world and encourage folks and train folks and teach folks. Little did I know that Air Force Special Warfare would say, hey, why don't you, why don't you come back and help us train kids, you know, be a senior advisor. Little did I know that SEAL Phil would begin to say, hey, Robert, you know, we like the way you work with kids or young people stuff, blah, blah, blah. But once the car gets rolling, doors open up. You know, if, it's, if the door's locked, there'll be a window. So I say that to your listener that entrepreneurship is risky. And it's hard because of the unknown, but you've got to believe that you have the right vision and you've got to go for it with everything and then see what happens. Cause it's, it's not where you start. It's what happens along the journey mm -hmm. that makes it like, Oh, you know, I didn't plan for this, but I'm gonna make a left turn here and a right turn there. Pretty soon you're successful, mm -hmm. but most people don't like risk. Most people don't like to be uncomfortable. Most people do not like the rush of almost making it, not making it, going broke, not going broke. You know, they want steady. They want, let's just be normal. Let's just get along. Let's just get a paycheck. And over 90% of the people in America will never try to start anything because they don't want the risk. But there are entrepreneurs who thrive on the risk. And they need the risk. And it, it makes them get out of bed in the morning. It makes their juices flow. They're, they're gifted for that kind of thing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So, so for, for you guys, hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. I just, I, I just came in. Um, you've, got to, you've got to know that it's going to cost you everything. And people are going to think you're crazy when you get that new venture capital, that new entrepreneur idea because most people will not see what you see. And then you have to find people around you who can see what you see. And that's a rarefied air breed, right? So entrepreneurship is really fun if you survive it. And if you don't survive it, it's full of divorces and pitfalls and going broke and living in your car and all kinds of stuff that can happen, but you roll the dice on you. Mm -hmm. And I, I um, endorse it, I, I encourage people to do it, but to do it wisely, get a strategy, do the research, count the costs, count the, how much time it's gonna take. And uh, most new um, entrepreneurship businesses fail in the first year because they didn't get that strategy and that research down. And it's what you don't know that bites you. So you've got to, how would you do it? How did you do it? Go, you know, get your minds for, mindset, mastermind groups or whatever it is. Ask the question, what question should I ask you that I don't even know how to ask you? And ask those things, oh, that's gold right there, you know? So I'm here because of an entrepreneurial idea of making a comeback. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage folks, you can do it too. I love it. I think, you know, I've been a lot of inspirational things that you've said, Robert, but I think the thing that I, I really enjoyed about talking with you as, as we start to wrap up here is... I think every other time I've listened to, whether it's an entrepreneur, athlete, any, and basically, you know, throwing in the bucket of motivational speaker, it's very period of your life centric, if you will. It's graduating college and going to do this, or, you know, getting a job and going to do this, or, you know, making it to the NFL and like all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's all before they're 30. And then, then I listened to you and you started breaking it down with those decades. And then you broke it down into the zero to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90. And that is such a better way of looking at it. And it's so much more, frankly, more motivational because it gives you the full wrap of what you're looking at, of what this journey is. It's not the inspirational speaker who says, go work your ass off for four years, make a million dollars, that's it. There's so much more after that. And I, I love it because you've really captured all of that and you've done a great job explaining it, I think. Well, thanks. It's when you're looking back, I'm 70 next year, you know, um, I'm looking back on, uh, wow, this decade worked like this and this decade worked like this. And I, I am fortunate, like your dad in some ways, we can look backwards. Young entrepreneurs, they look forward and they don't have that experience yet. And if you can find an old guy in your field that can say, what mistakes did you make? What would you do differently? 
you know, blah, 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 then get some of that wisdom. I mean, I, I'd like to show you all the scars on my back from what I've learned in life. <laughs> you know, I look good with a shirt on, but I, I paid a heavy price to have five kids and to do this and do that and blah, 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 you know, went through a divorce. Um, oh, sounds great to you lift up the sheets a little bit, look at all the damage mm-hmm. that you go through. And you, don't, you wanna help people have as, as least amount of damage in their life as possible. But you gotta ask the right questions and be around the right people. And it's a lifelong journey if you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. You'll, always, you'll always come up with another idea. I wonder if, <laughs> I, want, I mean, I saw these guys playing rugby the other day and I thought, I can do that. I can hit, I can train and get loose again. I could hit that guy. <laughs> My wife goes, don't do that. Don't do that. Mm-hmm. There, is, there is old boys rugby. I played a bit of it, you know. Uh, yeah. So there, that's all. Always... I guess there's a tournament in Hong Kong where all these old guys from around the world show up, you know. I watch it. And I go, look at that old guy at 75. You know? But they don't get you hit. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. Oh, man. This is, Robert, this has just been awesome. And, uh, you know, I'm going to shift shift gears a little bit to, to help us walk back to the barn and, Talk about what we learn, and man, in, in the in the list of things of so many things to learn while chatting with you just for this bit, it's it's going to be tough. So because it's tough, and because it's only one thing, Camden, you, you you're up. Yeah, you you could tell you could tell I was late. That that lead up was was going to you first, mm-hmm. there, buddy. What you learn? Well. I, I do have to say, just you know, just to reiterate that, Robert, I really enjoy talking with you, and I think that this is one of those conversations where I almost have trouble saying what I learned because there was so much, and there's so much different stuff that I feel like is hard to put into the nice, easy things. And so, despite despite all my notes I have here, I'm gonna stick with the easy one, which I wrote down at the beginning, which is crew rowing is apparently really freaking hard and I need to respect them more and put them up there on that crown with rugby and water polo. So now I've got three sports that I really respect and it's rugby, crew rowing and water polo. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I think I, we ought to also throw wrestling in there. Oh, there's, yeah. A, yeah. there's a grittiness in wrestling, you know, it's, it's tough. Anyway, I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun things to do out there that will test you. Mm-hmm. And those are good. Those three are, are good. A good three to do so. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, what do you think, Dad? Would you take away? Well, uh, yeah. That's what I, I'm. I'm looking at my long list too, and uh, I, I keep going back to just find a way to win. You know that that is just so powerful in, in so many different ways of thinking about it. Whether it's in the sports respect, or in business, or in just daily life find a way to win and then celebrate that win. So that's, that, that's for me is find a way to win. How about, how about you, Robert? You know, I think I talk too much. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, there's I, so much to share. You know, I, I think what I take away is I find myself when I'm talking to you, I smiling a lot. Mm-hmm. And it means that I have a passion for helping people. I have a passion for encouraging and developing and believing in people who maybe don't normally get believed in. It makes me want to get back into high schools and speak to kids. It makes me want to get with certain teams and, and try to help and encourage. I, um, I am, as you may have known, uh, I was a senior pastor for 25 years. I planted a church at the University of Nevada, Reno, and uh, became a chaplain for football and basketball and stuff. And I just so enjoyed seeing these new incoming scholarship kids. And like you'd say, some you could see it in their eyes are gonna fail. Some were there for the wrong reasons. Some really had it. And you could sit down and talk to them and say, you're screwed up, dude. You know, you lose your scholarship or what are you doing here? And just talk man to man to them, you know? And they get it, they'd make changes mm-hmm. and they'd adjust. And so I take away that I, I'm in my zone when I can encourage and I can help and I can, um, I can uh, make a difference somewhere in, in someone's life. I just like doing it. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I, I really appreciate that. How, how can uh, folks get in touch with you, find out more about what, what you got going on now and next? My website is my name. It's Robert Hamilton. Can you believe my mom gave me the name Hamilton? Robert Hamilton Owens.com. And the reason I use the middle name is that there's so many Robert Owenses out there. 
that they said you need to put something else to differentiate yourself. So that's why it's the full name. Um, they can get the book on Amazon or a lot of places, you know, hardback or softback. I get, um, I did a podcast like this just on the book and I got responses from 27 nations just off of one, one podcast about the book, which means people all over the world are looking to be encouraged and to believe and to try and do stuff, you know. Um, I think that the audio book is better because I'm laughing half the time. <laughs> I just, you guys won't believe this one, you know. <laughs> There, I have to tell you, though, if you buy the book, there's some cussing in it. And so just be aware that the first chapter is nothing but F-bombs. And the reason is, is that I say to them, I cannot take out the colorful language from the Navy SEAL instructors who are kicking my butt. It would not be right for me to sanitize what they did mm -hmm. to me. So I'm, I'm not going to endorse what I'm saying. I'm just going to say, this is what happened to me. And this is how they said it to me. And in the, in the audio book, I get to use those words in the way they yelled at me. And I just, I, oh man, I remember that. That was <laughs> miserable. <laughs> you effing loser, you effing embarrassment. What the F, you know, can't you do anything effing right? No, nonstop all the time. And so anyway, there's some, if you're going to give it to your kid, you know, I'd say, don't read this chapter if it's going to offend your kid. <laughs> but that's life. I hang out with men. I don't hang out with real you know, sweet man, I hang out with men <laughs> and they kick your butt. So it's in the book. Uh, other than that, um, I get, uh, my email is my name, uh, Robert Owens, but the Owens has two S's at Yahoo. Robert Owens was gone, so I stuck an extra S on. And so uh, Robert Owens for my email with two S's. And I, I field questions and take calls from people all over the world every week um, asking about how do you do this or what do you do here? What would you suggest? entrepreneurships and stuff. And so if they want to contact me, um, I'm usually pretty good at returning stuff uh, quickly because I like encouraging them. And that's about it. Robert Hamilton Owens or Robert Owens with two S's at yahoo.com. And uh, we can talk on the phone and do whatever we want. That's that's great, man. I, I mean, just just another testament to to your desire to help people and serve people. And, and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you so yeah, well, much. I, I'm looking. I'm looking for forward for someone to help me push my walker across the finish line <laughs> and go. Bada bang! You know, right. His wheels are really good on this walker. I, I was I was with a guy the other day. He's 83. He's done um, I don't know, like 65 marathons, and he was doing the LA Marathon, and he's on a walker. And so I said to him, "What did you do?" He said, "Well, they told me I couldn't do it unless I stayed on my walker." And I said, so what did you do? He said, well, I started off with the walker and then I just dumped it a mile into the race on the side. <laughs> I just kept on going and showed up. I finished without it. I said, that must have been sweet. They said, well, what happened to your walker? I threw it away. <laughs> I went, that's the kind of guy that's got some spirit, you know. Anyway, it, it's fun meeting you guys. Hope to talk again sometime. Keep up that rugby, U of A, and uh, having a nice dad like you have is a good thing. Thank, thanks again, Robert, man. It's been great. Camden, run us out, please. Hey, one last, one last thing. One last thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want all the listeners to do me a favor. I want them to write you and tell you what they got from this session. Because hmm. most of the time, the podcast people do this, but they don't get a ton of feedback. And so it's really helpful if the listener will write Otis or Camden and say, Hey, you guys, thanks for having that crazy guy on. And this is what I got out of it. And that, and then th this is what I'd like to have more of, or mm -hmm. this is what the kind of person that really helps me. And if you give feedback, these guys can do even a better job and have more fun. And you'll be a real help if you'll just communicate with them. So mm -hmm. please let Otis and Camden know what you're, what you're doing with this podcast, how long you've been watching it and what you got out of today. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate sure. that. <laughs> Thank you. Camden, run us out. All right. Thank you all again for listening to today's show. Special thanks to Robert Hamilton Owens for joining us today and our sponsors, MASH, Military and Athletic Strength Hemp Oil, and Verbi Virtual Events. You can check out recent episodes of the Cam and Otis Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and check out a full archive at thecaminotashow.buzzsprout.com. Cam and Otis Show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next week.